Taylor Swift is one of the most well-known pop stars out there, and she hasn't been on tour in about four years. Whether you love her or hate her, or maybe somewhere in between, there's absolutely no denying the impact she's had on the music industry. So expectedly, when she announced the Eras tour, fans were scrambling to buy tickets. They paid exorbitant prices, and these are the ones that even got the chance to buy tickets in the first place. Julia told her followers on YouTube that she paid $600 for a ticket that was in line with a side of the stage, and she wasn't sure it was gonna even have a good view. Others shared videos of their screens where tickets were on sale for upwards of $20,000. Timeouts, waits of nine hours to get tickets, or waiting six to eight hours just to be told that they were sold out was all common. You'd think that with this much chaos to get tickets, there would be an apparent reason. Maybe the site went down or the general public just broke it, right? Well, no, not exactly. Instead, the website where this all took place, Ticketmaster, wasn't even open to the general public at this time. All of this mayhem and madness happened during the pre-sale when fans were invited to buy tickets absolutely swarmed Ticketmaster. About 3.5 million people pre-registered during Taylor Swift's verified fan sale. And of those 3.5 million, one and a half were invited while 2 million were just waitlisted. And this was done to prevent bot attacks, though this plan clearly didn't work out all that well when the site was flooded with them to the point that Ticketmaster blamed bot attacks for this fiasco in the first place. And truthfully, it just sounds like they weren't prepared at all, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Typically, what we'll hear is some shallow corporate apology, a few days of angry tweets, and then the world moves on to the next thing to be mad at. And to some extent, yeah, that's kind of exactly what happened. Ticketmaster said, quote, "'We want to apologize to Taylor and all her fans, "'especially those who had a terrible experience "'trying to purchase tickets.'" And just FYI, Ticketmaster, saying we want to apologize isn't actually much of an apology. It kind of sounds like a sorry if your feelings got hurt type of apology instead of actually taking responsibility. But again, just my opinion here. Anyway, though I'm sure Ticketmaster hoped this would just blow over, this debacle was so ridiculous that authorities got involved. The LA Times published an article questioning if the government may actually take the crackdown on bots seriously now that we can see the repercussions in real time. Live Nation Entertainment, the parent company, is being investigated by the Justice Department. And to top it off, some senators say that the Live Nation and Ticketmaster merger that created LNE in the first place needs to be undone. And look, this is America. It's hard to get the government to take any shady business all that seriously, especially when, you know, they're usually deeply entrenched in it themselves. So you better believe that if they're looking into a concert ticket company, things have to be pretty terrible. But just how terrible are they? Well. That's what we're gonna try and find out today. Hello and welcome to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati and today we're going to be chatting about Live Nation Entertainment, the behemoth that is Ticketmaster and Live Nation. Here's the first important piece that you have to recognize about this merger. Everybody actually dreaded it. And okay, maybe not like everyone. I know if I speak in broad strokes here, there's gonna be one random comment somewhere that's like, well, actually, but I think most of you get my point because most of you are pretty sensible folks. This was pretty much a bad idea from the start is really the point that I wanna drill home here. Live Nation was the world's biggest concert promoter and Ticketmaster was the leading ticket provider back in 2010 when they joined forces. So gee, I wonder why anyone would be concerned about that, right? It's pretty obvious that this was an attempt to corner the market and kind of become a little mini monopoly. Plus, as a little added bonus to everyone involved, it eliminated some competition right from the start. You see, Live Nation, which was founded in 1996, had intentions to start selling tickets, and Ticketmaster, founded 20 years prior, also acquired Frontline Management, an artist management and representation firm. So while Live Nation was obviously more known for promotion and Ticketmaster for tickets, this put the two companies neck and neck, But hey, why promote healthy competition when you can just become an unbeatable giant instead? Well, that's pretty much what they tried to do here. But don't just try to blame the merger for playing Monopoly though. Ticketmaster had complaints about being anti-competitive years before they joined forces with Live Nation. Back in 1994, Pearl Jam sued them for buying up competitors and abusing their marketplace dominance by demanding high service fees and signing exclusive deals with major concert venues, leaving consumers and artists with no alternative. Sure, there are other companies like Eventbrite, Tickets.com, SeatGeek, and StubHub, but all those competitors share only 30% of the pie for tickets and live events, 20% if we're talking about live concerts. Therefore, 
eight times out of 10, if you wanna see your favorite musician perform, you will be using Ticketmaster. The writing was on the wall, the accusations about being a monopoly had been made, but the Department of Justice didn't move on this Pearl Jam versus Ticketmaster case. I bet they're kind of kicking themselves for that now, and if not, they really should be. If Ticketmaster were running their business in an honest, fair, and responsible manner, then maybe my complaints would be minimal. Someone could easily argue, hey, they're not a monopoly because they swallow up everyone else. Maybe they're just a master at selling tickets. That's why they're called Ticketmaster, right? But that's not how monopolies in the US work. You thought ethics would win the day? More like how much you own and what you can get away with. Concerns about Ticketmaster crippling competitors in the ticket business were in full swing as the years passed by. But as the New York Times wrote in 2018, feds tried to reassure the skeptics. They told the public not to worry because they had a strict policy in place for the merger approval and they were really going to hold Live Nation Entertainment to it. Just like they held Ticketmaster accountable in 1994, apparently. Quote, there will be enough air and sunlight in this space for strong competitors to take root, grow and thrive, said the country's top antitrust regulator, Assistant Attorney General, Christine A. Varney. And she went further, suggesting that reduced ticket service fees, even lower ticket prices might be on the horizon. And Varney, I know you wanted to give people hope, but who the hell are we fooling here exactly? What company practically doubles in size and then lowers its prices? Unsurprisingly here, she was proven wrong. Their 80% slice of the pie remains, ticket prices are at record highs, no competitor has been able to touch them, and now the DOJ has decided, gee willikers, maybe we should have taken action sooner. Like no shit, dumbass. And now I do like Pearl Jam, not my favorite band in the whole world, but I do like me some Pearl Jam from time to time. And I have to give them a hand here. They saw the writing on the wall back in 1994, long before anyone else did. It's unfortunate that it's taken so long before the Justice Department has decided to act because now it feels like it's too late. Apparently, Varney was offered a chance to comment now that it's become clear that they really shouldn't have shepherded this agreement as the New York Times puts it. But Varney declined to comment. Maybe she just wants to forget this as much as we wish we could. Now, Ticketmaster sounds like some kind of mob boss spinning on a leather chair with a white cat in their lap whenever they talk to artists. According to one complaint, the Gwinnett Center switched to AEG, Ticketmaster's top competitor around 2013. Then out of the blue, they didn't receive an expected booking from the band Matchbox 20. Gwinnett's booking director told Live Nation not to abandon them, and if there was an issue, he'd be willing to address it. Live Nation, in true mob boss sounding fashion, wrote back, quote, issue? Three letters, can you guess what they are? And I'm pretty sure they're referring to AEG as the three letters in question. I bet whatever Live Nation coordinator wrote this thought they sounded cool as hell, but in reality, they sounded like a toddler throwing a tantrum. And let's be clear here, as childish and pathetic as this all sounds, there seems to be a lot of evidence that Live Nation Entertainment operates through threats. AEG says that other venues they've managed have said that they'll lose valuable shows if Ticketmaster wasn't used as the vendor. Gwinnett's tours were cut in half, supposedly a routine fluctuation, despite the Gwinnett booking director stating he warned the center would be put in a literal boycott for choosing a competitor. And this, by the way, violates antitrust laws if it's true. And AEG has forwarded these emails to justice officials as evidence. I know it's hard to feel bad for stadiums, millionaire artists, and CEOs of possible competitors, but it's not only the big people and big businesses involved here. Let's take a look at the little guy and how they've been treated by Live Nation Entertainment too. While what happened to Taylor Swift was ridiculous, frustrating, and upsetting, I'd argue that what happens to smaller musicians is even worse. At the end of the day, Taylor Swift is going to be absolutely fine. She's not going to have to worry about breaking even and what fees Ticketmaster is going to charge in the same way a local band will. Her situation is shining a spotlight on these shady dealings because she has the platform to do so. It's affected a wide audience. Unfortunately, smaller creators have dealt with this questionable company too, and they don't have the platform to gain attention. Let's take a look at some of these experiences, like from the band Lawrence. Clyde Lawrence, the leader of the band, wrote an op-ed on the New York Times a few months ago, explaining that the controversy around Taylor Swift is only the tip of the iceberg. He's been so frustrated by Live Nation Entertainment that one of the lyrics in his song, False Alarms, downright calls the company a monopoly. Even if the Department of Justice has been so hesitant in the past to go after them and classify them as such, if it acts like a monopoly, talks like a monopoly, and crushes competitors like a monopoly, it's probably a fucking monopoly. As for Lawrence, here's what working with this company looks like. 
If his group plays a sold out show at a Live Nation owned and operated venue, the fixed fee the venue takes will already eat into a lot of the money they make. In his hypothetical example, it costs 30,000 for this fixed fee or house nut, another 10,000 for marketing and even $250 for clean towels. And I tell you what, if you're paying $250 for some clean towels, those towels better be made out of like the finest cotton in the world at that price, because that is insane. I've seen what towels go for on Amazon. I literally am in the middle of moving and had to buy some towels. So they do not cost $250. Once all of that has been deducted, the remainder is then split between Live Nation and the band with a profit of about $12 per $30 ticket. Live Nation has claimed that artists receive a majority of ticket sales, but if you know elementary school math, you'll know that 12 is not the majority of 30. Maybe the Live Nation CEO, Michael Rapino, just passed that lesson in fourth grade, but it doesn't matter, I guess, because he's the CEO of a company, so who the fuck needs math, right? Anyway, let's move on. Lawrence continues that in this hypothetical, fans didn't pay $30 for a ticket, they actually paid $42 because of the substantial ticket fee. Quote, so of the $42 a fan spent on a ticket, the artist received 12. And from that $12, the artist needs to pay for touring costs, such as lodging, transportation, and its own touring crew. That's roughly 50%. So that leaves $6 for the artist, in our case, an eight piece band. Keep in mind that's pre-tax and we pay for our own health insurance. So that's barely a dollar a person when you get down to it. Don't get me wrong, if Lawrence is selling out stadiums with tens of thousands of seats, that's still a lot of cash rolling in, but that's not really the case for low or mid-level bands. I wonder how fans would feel if they actually saw these kinds of breakdowns. Probably not too thrilled at Live Nation Entertainment, I'd bet. Now, I can guess what some bands and even Ticketmaster themselves would say. They don't make a ton of money at these concerts either. And if Ticketmaster ever showed you a breakdown or settlement sheet after a show, then maybe you would believe this. But as Lawrence explains, this actually does not include their fees, bar sales, and merchandise sales, meaning these companies could make a significant amount more than what they're willing to admit to the band's faces. After all, it's not a good look when this titan of industry is reporting record revenues. And I do mean record revenues, 66% more in 2022 than in 2019 at over $6 billion. And this is all while smaller and mid-level artists repeatedly have to cancel tours because the cost is too high. If Ticketmaster were really on these artists' sides, then they should be feeling the impact too, right? But strangely enough, it's only the artists that are struggling. Now, this isn't to say that Ticketmaster has never done anything for its bands. Even Lawrence will concede to this and say that they do offer upfront guarantees and have solid Live Nation representatives that do their best to advocate for the band's interests. Even so, there are a few clear things that could change and go a long way towards showing musicians that Ticketmaster and Live Nation actually care, steps that they just don't seem willing to take. Lowering their cut on merch sales would be probably a good starter or making people more aware of their off-platform ticketing. For instance, did you know that in many venues contracts, 10% of tickets sold can go to fan clubs or people artists that have a direct relationship with? Tickets which artists can control the fees on. Yeah, according to Lawrence, many artists didn't even know that this option exists. Live Nation could put this on their promotional material and make people aware of it to show their support, but it doesn't seem like they do. Maybe because it just doesn't benefit them as a company, who knows? And to be clear here, I'm sure other ticketing companies probably have similar issues too. It's not as if AEG or their competitors are all perfect and Ticketmaster is the only one profiting off musicians hard work but Live Nation Entertainment is the biggest name out there. And unfortunately, they're setting a precedent for how things are done. And it doesn't get better from here either. What do you think of when you hear the word scalper? Chances are you're picturing a CD ticket reseller standing outside of a concert with you know a big trench coat and they phew, rip it open and they're offering last minute seats for those desperately in need at like 10 times the normal cost. Or maybe you're picturing the people behind these bots, those that purchased the cheapest Taylor Swift seats they could only to turn around and make thousands of dollars off of real fans that wanted them. Whatever the image in your mind's eye is, it's probably not a positive one. The term scalper has obvious negative connotations, but these guys are supposed to be the nemesis of Ticketmaster, right? Ticketmaster has fair, if a little bit pricey seats, and then these scalpers come in, buy them up and get more money in their pockets because of it. As it turns out, that's not actually the full story even if it's the one Ticketmaster would probably wish you believed. A few years ago in 2018 to 2019, CBC News and Toronto Star investigated how Ticketmaster was driving up concert prices and discovered that they were actually partnering with scalpers. 
After all, the higher the cost, the bigger the profit for them too. Not only did Ticketmaster collect fees twice on scalp tickets, but they don't list every seat when a sale begins either. This artificially drives the price up by making things appear to sell out, giving the impression of high demand. Certainly, a Bruno Mars concert is going to have high demand as is, but it'll look even more appealing when seemingly everyone wants to go. Plus, prices are subject to change, meaning that Ticketmaster can effectively lie, state that a show is sold out and another 100 or so tickets for sale on their website are available a week later, but they'll charge double for it. It might not technically be illegal, but it is gross as fuck. And of course, say it with me the favorite line, it gets worse because it always does. The Toronto Star piece on this investigation is especially telling. Here's a taste. Their headline reads, we went undercover as ticket scalpers and Ticketmaster offered to help us do business. In case you couldn't tell, this is about to be one infuriating ride. These investigative reporters went to the scalpers convention in Las Vegas and found representatives at Ticketmaster's resale desk as if they didn't have a big enough scalper problem already. Ticketmaster wasn't just saying, oh, hey, if you resell with us, here's how to do it the safe way. Of course not. They were actually selling software that scalpers can use to manage their, quote, vast inventory of seats. To repeat how fucking ridiculous that is, let me reiterate, Ticketmaster, who is known for having extensive issues with scalpers marking up their tickets to the point where fans and consumers feel helpless, have continued to actively encourage scalpers to come to their platform. And I'm sorry, but do they even give a shit about the fans actually seeing shows that they enjoy at this point? Their company claims that they're committed to getting tickets directly into the fans of hands, but personally, I think that's pure and utter bullshit. Unless they want to add the statement, after they get into the hands of a reseller first at the end of it, I think this is a bit disingenuous. Besides that, this Ticketmaster representative knows that these resellers have multiple accounts, with the rep at the convention happily telling the undercover reporters that one of his clients has about 200 accounts. After all, ticket limits are around six or eight, and so you, quote, can't make a living off of that. The representative also seems to brag about how hands-off their approach is and how they don't send reports to the police or effectively snitch on any of the questionable clients they've got too. It's church and state. We don't monitor that at all, the representative said. Again, remember that Ticketmaster also gets to double charge their own fees when tickets are resold too, meaning the company actively profits from scalpers being on their platform. It makes things look more in demand. Live Nation Entertainment will get a bigger piece of the pie. The fees go up. It's no wonder they're courting scalpers in Vegas convention centers. The Toronto Star added that the company's resale senior director also held a conference for scalpers, one that was closed to the media. Quote, an image of a sharply ascending graph illustrating broker registrations over the past five years looms behind him. It was headlined, we appreciate your partnership. More brokers are listing with Ticketmaster than ever before. But, yeah, totally, Ticketmaster absolutely cares about the fans. If all these scalpers are big Swifties, that is, then yeah, sure, they totally care. But before we go on to take a look at some of the potential and current consequences for Ticketmaster and Live Nation, let's just take a quick moment to thank today's sponsors. If you're anything like most people, setting grand resolutions for the new year doesn't really work out. It all feels pretty daunting. So maybe try this instead. Start small and think about the little habit changes you can make one step at a time. That's why Blue Land is perfect, because they make it so easy to start a new low-waste lifestyle. No massive overhaul to your routine, just tiny changes that add up to a huge impact. Blue Land is on a mission to eliminate single-use plastic by reinventing cleaning essentials to be better for you and the planet. And they have everything from cleaning sprays to hand soap, toilet bowl cleaners, and laundry tablets. All Blue Land products are made with clean ingredients that you can feel good about. Try their Clean Essentials Kit, which has everything you need to get started. It's three bottles of cleaner plus a bottle of hand soap. And it comes in beautiful light scents, such as iris agave, fresh lemon, and eucalyptus mint. And of course, one of my favorites from Blue Land is their laundry kit. And I love their laundry detergent also because it's scent free and it's gentle and I have sensitive skin. Y'all know I have psoriasis. So for me personally, it has been a godsend. Plus I really love their wool balls that I put in the dryer. It just, all of it just works together so nicely. And Blue Land has a special offer to start the year off. For all Corporate Casket listeners, you can get 15% off your first purchase of any product to get you and your year started right. So to get your 15% off your first order, just go to blueland.com slash casket. That's 15% off your first order right now when you go to blueland.com slash casket. Again, blueland.com slash casket. 
And after a day of cleaning and kind of tidying up the house, you know what feels really darn good? That's right, getting a little munch and crunch and having a delicious snack. And that's where HelloFresh comes in. You can count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. And that's why it's America's number one meal kit. With HelloFresh, eating well in the new year can actually be stress-free and delicious. With over 35 weekly recipes, they have the options you're looking for to help you achieve your goals. You can choose from calorie smart and carb smart recipes, or even customize select meals by swapping proteins or sides, upgrading proteins, or adding protein to a veggie dish. Eating well is top of mind this month. And it's comforting to know that you can always get top quality from HelloFresh. Ingredients travel from the farm to you in less than seven days. And that includes their fast and fresh recipes, which is one of my favorite parts of HelloFresh with most of these menu items being ready in 15 minutes or less. Enjoy the taste and quality done quick with recipes like falafel power bowls, which don't sleep on it, seared steak and potatoes with Bernays sauce or Southwest pork and bean burritos. So if you're ready to get your year started right, make sure you go to hellofresh.com slash casket22 and use code casket22 for 22 free meals plus free shipping. Again, that's hellofresh.com slash casket22 and use code casket22 for 22 free meals plus free shipping. Now, when all the Ticketmaster and Live Nation news started coming out, the public didn't exactly react positively to the news, as you could imagine. And senators launched an investigation against Ticketmaster in 2019. This wasn't really just about scalpers though. Remember how they promised not to be anti-competitive back in 2010 when they merged? Well, the DOJ told everyone, hey, don't worry, we're going to be really careful and make sure other platforms can compete. But here Ticketmaster was proving them all wrong. The senators wrote that the losers in all of this are the American people, as Ticketmaster was violating the behavioral conditions previously outlined for them. And that's true. The American people and the public at large are the ones suffering here because they have to use a shitty platform that puts profits over their concert experience. But at the end of the day, I don't only blame Ticketmaster. The DOJ is responsible here too. Ticketmaster had already been sued almost 20 years before the merger for being anti-competitive. Musicians looked at this merger with absolute dread And the DOJ just said, nah, chief, don't worry. We'll make sure they behave. The utter lack of hindsight is just upsetting. The Senate letter investigating Ticketmaster is a great start. And it points out to all the things it seems like those close to the situation wish they could have said years ago. More competition is needed. This is becoming a monopoly and things of that nature. As for Ticketmaster's response to all of this, well, that's been plain laughable. According to President Jared Smith, and I quote, this is what he had to say. Ticketmaster does not have and has never had any product or program that allows ticket scalpers or anyone else to buy tickets ahead of fans and circumvent the policies we have on our site regarding online ticket purchasing limits. Then my question is, what exactly is your resale program doing? Sure, selling tickets you don't need anymore is bound to happen, but why is one of your representatives telling the Toronto Star at a scalpers convention that they know of someone who has 200 accounts they use to sell tickets professionally? And interestingly enough, one of the complaints that I didn't actually hear were people saying that scalpers were able to buy tickets ahead of fans. They were able to integrate with the fans, but if someone theoretically has over 200 fucking accounts and now you've got hundreds, if not thousands of those people, that becomes thousands of accounts. So yeah, they're gonna intermingle and just beat out fans. But I don't ever hear a complaint where someone was like, no, 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 they can buy tickets ahead of fans. So I'm like, why did you even put that argument in there? It means nothing. Denial doesn't work that great when your representatives are caught on video saying this, Jared, by the way, like they're the ones who were engaging with the scalpers and being all excited about this shit. Now for legal reasons, of course, this is my opinion that he's lying, but it's also my opinion that the sky is blue and the grass is green. Now it's also not just the senators that took action either. Fans were infuriated to hear this and they sued calling their resale program a highly controlled black market scheme with the suit encompassing anyone who had to buy a ticket from a professional reseller. Another class action lawsuit was also pending around this time, but for their high prices in Canada. But, and I'm about to sound like a bit of an infomercial here, that's not all folks. Yet another class action lawsuit was filed against them only a few weeks ago because of their refund policy now. So at the end of the day, Even if you pay a ridiculously high price for tickets, potentially from a professional reseller, and they move the event, Ticketmaster might give you a hard time for trying to get the refund too. They make money with tickets being resold, yet how dare you try to refund your ticket because the event isn't even happening, at least not in the near future anyway. 
The long and the short of this suit is that during the pandemic, a ton of events were indefinitely postponed. They weren't technically canceled, which meant that customers weren't able to request a refund. But personally, I feel that an indefinite postponement isn't much better. The fact is that some people may need to take off work or travel or rearrange their calendars for live concerts. So when something is rescheduled, they may not be able to do that again. A customer bought a ticket to that event because that date worked for them. Expecting them to suck it up and eat the cost because of COVID is a garbage refund policy. Plus about 90% of their events were indefinitely postponed too. So it's not as if this happened to a few people or for a few shows. It just kind of seems like Ticketmaster was avoiding reimbursements and it's kind of as simple as that for an explanation. This is especially scummy too, when you consider that people were losing their jobs during the pandemic. Imagine that one day you have a well-paying job and you treated yourself to a $600 ticket to see a rock concert. Then you lose your job, the economy starts spiraling, inflation goes through the roof, and you now can't even get that $600 back because the concert will happen eventually. And it's not like this is some hypothetical statement or theory that I'm putting in front of you. This is not some implausible event. This is pretty much exactly what happened to lead plaintiff Derek Hansen, who helped spark this lawsuit when he was tired of Ticketmaster's treatment of him. And Derek is far from alone. After this latest scandal with the Taylor Swift incident, many are speculating if this is the end of Ticketmaster's monopoly. They've clearly had controversies before, but none have been quite this public and messy either. Back in 2013, for example, they had to pay $23 million after forcibly enrolling customers in a $9 monthly rewards program. A rewards program that offered no real benefits whatsoever, might I add. And as gross as that is, it's paled in comparison to seeing $20,000 Taylor Swift tickets and hearing their representatives talk about reseller partnerships. No one seemed to care too much about their security breach a few years ago either, because it's something that's become depressingly common too dumb subscription fees, selling data, and even the fact that they're a monopoly is just also standard and expected of large companies at this point in time. But this time, Ticketmaster seems to have gone too far. And I'd say between the 2019 and 2023 controversies, they deserve to be separated from Live Nation at the very least. I'll be curious to see what comes of this investigation. That's a show I can't wait to see. Though I won't be going to Live Nation Entertainment for the tickets to see it. But with all of that being said, that is where we're going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something new here today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest episodes. I really appreciate you taking some time out of your day to hang out, listen to what I've come up with and you know, enjoy the rest of your day. I don't know what you're up to. Maybe it's day, maybe it's night when you're listening. I hope you had a good whatever it is. So thank you so much for joining me. If you'd like to connect with me outside of these episodes, please click the link tree link in my description box. It's just got all of my social media nicely organized and all projects that I'm currently involved in. So again, thank you so much for joining me. I really do appreciate it. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.